live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE, covering Microsoft Ignite. Brought to you by Cohesity. Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of Microsoft Ignite. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host Stu Miniman. We are joined, joined by Donna Sarkar. She is the advocate lead Microsoft Power Platform at Microsoft. Thank you so much for coming Thank on the you. show. Thank you very much for having me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Cube land. So tell us a little bit about Power Platform. It's something we're yeah. hearing some buzz about, mm -hmm. but we still need the overview. What is yeah. it all about? All right, so for years, decades, we in the tech industry have been on this mission where we say everyone in the world can benefit from learning to code, right? Uh, whether you're a farmer, an accountant, a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor, some sort of code will help you do your job better and you'll be able to automate away boring tasks and make apps and websites to solve your business problems, right? We've been saying this forever. And soon, we started to realize, like, why are we asking everyone to learn to code when the end goal is to solve those business problems, right? So instead of learning to code, why not create a suite of low-code or no-code tools so all of these people who we call citizen developers, who may not be professional developers, as in they didn't go to computer science school, they didn't do a coding boot camp, they don't live in Visual Studio all day. How can they use these low code tools to solve their specific business problems? So that's like the vision of Power Platform. And there are, I would say, six independent pillars of it. Um, the first one, the one that most people know, is Power BI, which is a dashboard to visualize data and, you know, um, traction in your business and all of that. So that's the one that most of the Fortune 500 are like quite familiar with. The second one that I think a lot of people have used used to be called Microsoft Flow. So this is a automation tool where you'd say, if I get an email, send me a text. You know, a kind of a, if this happens, then that happens. It's just a logical tool that connects lots and lots of services in our life together. That has been renamed to Power Automate to focus more a lot on the automation that many businesses have that we actually have not thought about for decades. How do we automate some of these processes that people have to do all the time? Third thing. Just, just, yeah. If I could, yeah, so of course. one of the new announcements this yeah. week, Power Automate is Power the, Automate. the RPA piece yes. uh, come out there. So it, I guess yeah. it's a suite and this is a new offering as yes. part of that? Yes, so RPA, the robotic process automation, is how we can um, do UI automation, which is a huge pain in the neck. Like, it's terrible because you say, oh, click box, wait three seconds, wait for this thing to happen, sleep 10 seconds. It is terrible. I've done UI automation, I hate it, UI automation so much. So RPA, what it does for you is you perform the ac actions and the code is generated and it replays. So that is this powerful tool for anyone who has to do any sort of repetitive scan form, scan form, scan form, you know, sort of thing. So Power Automate, the third pillar is Power Apps, which I think everyone hears a lot about today, which is um, apps that are generated from whatever data source that you've got. Say you've got an Excel spreadsheet having, and I saw all of your guests are all tracked in an Excel spreadsheet, right? Donna's coming now, Christina's coming next, and there's Christina now. And imagine you can see them in an app instead, and all of you have this app on your phone. You can say, oh, what's on the docket for today, right? Donna's showing up at 11, Christina's at 11.30. What are the questions we want to ask Donna? Click on the Donna tab, you get all the questions you want to talk to her about, et cetera. So Power Apps is a way to quickly generate an app from a data source without code. We have a whole bunch of templates depending on what you're trying to do. So maybe you're trying to make a gallery of photos or you're trying to make like an expense tool or like a gas mileage tool or whatever you're trying to do that every single business in the world has the same tools, slightly different. So the fourth thing is um, a new announcement called Power Virtual Assist, which is, um, think about it as simplified chatbots, right? Chatbots are everywhere. Uh, the way people think about making them is, oh, I have to go get Azure Cognitive Services and learn it deeply and become an uh, AI expert and learn to like speak natural language processing stuff. But in fact, you can build a chatbot in five minutes using Power Virtual Assist, which is fantastic and really cool. And running through all of this is my favorite that I learned a lot about this week, which is called AI Builder. And AI Builder is um, a tool, really, that brings intelligence to all of these things. It makes you feel like kind of a badass. I'm like, oh, I trained an AI model and deployed it and tested it on stage. That's crazy and cool. And I learned to do that in five minutes. And believe you me, I'm not a data scientist. So. 
It was a really, really cool set of tools that I personally, even as a pro developer, am very excited about. Well, I want to dig into the tools more yeah, and what they can do, do yeah. but, but I first want to ask you a personal question, because yeah. you're new to the role. You've I been am. there two weeks. Yeah. What made you, what, what was exciting to you about working with Power Platforms? So I've been at Microsoft for 14 years and I've always been in the Windows division and I've always worked in a software engineering function. So always dealing with like C++ code, COM code, how do we, what product code do we, changes do we make to Windows the OS. And recently I've been realizing that my personal mission, that anyone in the world should have my opportunities, it's, that's really important to me, right? I grew up underserved society in Detroit, Michigan, right? I don't. I often feel like I don't deserve this life that I have, and I fell into it because of luck and circumstance. And I want other people to have these opportunities and not feel that same kind of impostering. So I always believe that tech is this, you know, this sword, this weapon that you can wield, and it will, as you make your way through the world, and it creates so many opportunities, right? It, the oper and anyone in the world wants to hire a software engineer, every company. Right, every company wants to hire devs. It doesn't matter if you're like government or like oil rigs, you want software developers. And I thought, what an amazing economic power, and I want lots of people to have that. And lo and behold, I was offered the opportunity to head up a brand new advocacy team for the Power Platform um, as part of the Azure Advocates organization. And I said, oh, that's amazing to be able to line up my personal passion with a mission in the company. That doesn't come along very often. Yeah. So I love my job. So it's interesting, so Donna. Cool. I would love your viewpoint as someone yeah. that's been with Microsoft uh, for, yeah. for 14 years, because mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of the advocacy people, yeah. and many of them are ones that, if you ask them if they would have joined Microsoft yeah. five years ago, the answer is uh, I'm not, not so sure. sure. Um, so yeah. you know, moving from Windows to there, tell us a little yeah. bit about culturally what's different about Microsoft today, yeah. and you know, much more obviously than just Windows. Yeah, um, I would say that there's three things that are dramatically different. There's a lot of like things that people notice, but three things I think that are just you can't even argue about it. One, we are definitely a learn-it-all mindset rather than a know-it-all where it's actually much better now to say, I do not know. Let's go find out, let's go do an experiment, and then we'll have an answer. And that's much better than with great confidence saying something wrong, right? Oh, I know this will work for sure. I guarantee it, and then it not working because you're being a know-it-all rather than the learn-it-all. So that tolerance is off the charts. It's, it's expected. If you come in with a strong opinion with no sort of experimental data to back it up, that's no longer a good thing, right? Now people almost are suspicious, like really? Why do you, why do you think that? Have you checked it? Have you done the experiment? The second thing is um, this co-creating with customers. Before, like you're asking about Windows, I worked on Windows 5 versions, and it always went a little like this, right? We as the developers would go and hide in Redmond, Washington for three and a half years, and one day we would show up and say, here is your operating system, we'll see you in three years, have fun using it, bye, and then we go off and make another operating system, right? We didn't stick around to figure out, is this operating system working for you? Are you being successful, what you're trying to do? Are your customers successful? We just went ahead and made what we thought was next, right? Because we were convinced we knew better. But with Windows 10 and every other product at Microsoft now, we actually co-create with our customers, right? That feedback loop is part of the product cycle, where we don't ship a product without having a feedback loop. So we ship something, how are we getting feedback? What is the time baked in to actually take that feedback and make changes? So that's one thing, it's dramatically different. Um, it used to all be time to code product, time to fix bugs, that's it. Now it's code product, listen to customer feedback, fix bugs from customers. That's it. So it dramatically shortened the amount of time it took to build an operating system because we don't need to make a three year long product. Instead we make like a six month long product. And when I ran the Windows Insider program, we were testing Windows every week, right? Twice a week we're rolling out versions of Windows to millions of people getting their feedback in real time. And the third thing I'd say that's been a dramatic transformation is this inclusivity of not just different kinds of you know, race, ethnicity, but work styles, the kinds of businesses we do work with. Like, we're a, we do Linux now, right? We do Linux. Um, Power Platform itself pulls from all sorts of data sources. We don't just say, we only pull from Microsoft tech. Like, if you have Excel, if you have Access, if you have Azure, if you have SQL, we support you and everyone else go the heck away. No, we're, we're saying whatever data source you've got, 
we don't care. We'll build you a power app based on your data source. Bring your whole self to work, right? It's that bring your whole self to work mindset that I think has permeated just across the company and it shows in our products. So you were talking about this feedback loop. Yes. And I'm interested because these, these, the Power Platform was yeah. rolled out in 2018. Yeah. We haven't seen any major revenue yet, but Microsoft sees a ton of promise here. So what was the customer feedback you were given in terms of these updates that you just announced here at Ignite? Right. And what, what were customers demanding, wanting, needing from these, yeah. these, these, these tools? Well, uh, there's been a few things. One, um, the uptake in Power Platform, especially Power Apps, is the fastest growth of any business app in Microsoft history. Um, in the last, like, just two years, we've reached 84% of the Fortune 500 are running Power Apps now. That's kind of wild, right? When you think, these are normally traditional companies who can be quite conservative, but they've got people, whether it's in IT, it's a citizen dev or a pro dev, they're actually building Power Apps to supplement their business needs, right? So it's been just astronomical growth, which is fantastic. Um, and the feedback from this group is actually what dictates all of the changes we've been making. So one of the key things a lot of people said was, we just adopted Teams like last year, right? Our company adopted Teams, we're all in on Teams, all of our communication, like real time is done on Teams. But Power Platform is not with Teams. What's the, what's the deal with that, right? So the Power Platform dev team, engineering team, actually went and figured out how can you have a Teams channel, how can you build a Power, plat a power App and then share that Power App within your Teams, specifically. So say the three of us are working on a Teams channel and I make a, oh, track your attendees app, the one we're talking about, I can share it within the Teams itself and we can just see it from within the Teams window. So it'll run within the Teams window, um, we can just deploy it to our phones as well and with the same Teams credentials as we're working, that applies to the app as well. So that's something that just rolled out this week as direct feedback from people who say, we're, we want in on the latest and greatest, and that means Teams, that means SharePoint Online, that means Power Platform, that means all the things now. Yeah. So Donna, one of the things I, I love that you talked about is it, it doesn't take months to get started on no, this. that's right. Uh, so many announcements that you talked yeah. through, all the six pillars and everything. Uh, for those people out there seeing what's new, give them some final tips as to yeah. how they should get started with, with uh, the Power Platform family. I would say that um, one of the best things you can do is just get your hands on it. Right, stop reading about it, stop looking at the announcements, just get your hands on it. Because I was at first reading all these blog posts trying to understand CDS, Power Platform, AI Builder, all this stuff, stop, just don't do it. The best thing to do is to go get on Microsoft Learn, there's a start, uh, starter tutorial called uh, Canvas Apps for Power Platform, um, and go do the tutorial. All it does is it deploys an Excel spreadsheet to your personal machine or your personal OneDrive, whatever it is, and using that, it's just carpet, right? It's like black carpet, white carpet, it shows pictures of carpet, and then you generate a Power App and it shows it in a gallery view on an app that you just see on your computer and then you deploy it to your phone. All it does is show you the power of an Excel spreadsheet converted into an app. So I've created a short URL for it just to make life easier for everyone. So it's aka.ms power up. Super straightforward, super simple. And I talk about this tutorial all the time, not because I think it's the best tutorial that's ever existed, but for someone who has absolutely no idea and they're feeling intimidated to start, this is exactly the right thing to do because this tutorial, I am not kidding you, both of you can do it in five minutes. Like on the next break, once you finish with me and Christina, I challenge you to do the tutorial. All right, okay, yeah. challenge accepted. One, one final thing, so you are known for this TED talk that you gave on imposter syndrome. Earlier in, this, in our conversation, you yes. said you fell into this life. Oh, you absolutely. feel like you've gotten lucky, yeah. but yet you're a smart woman. Talk about imposter syndrome and then, and then give your best advice for yeah. the young people out there, and, and old people too, frankly, yeah. who, are, who are suffering. <laughs> imposter syndrome is a killer because it is a disease that is a global epidemic. It's not a, some people think it's a women's problem, it's a people of color problem, no it's not. It's an everyone problem. Every time I give this talk, the TED audience was thousands of people, I would say about 70% men. And when I asked how many of you feel these symptoms, hands are up, 70% of people. And this was men too, who feel like, I got here, you know, the thoughts are usually, I got here by accident, it was dumb luck, there was a mistake in the process, I slipped in under the radar, any minute now someone's going to show up here and say, you don't belong here, get out. 
or someone's going to check my credentials or ask me like, how do you think you're as good as the people around you? Or why are you qualified to speak on this topic, right? People are convinced this is going to happen. Like almost everyone is convinced and it's wild. And I've realized the reason it happens is because we are not used to doing that thing yet. That's it. We don't imposter about the things we do every day. You don't imposter about being in camera, on front of the camera, in front of everyone, because you do it all the time. And you've gotten good reviews, and obviously people come to talk to you. But if tomorrow I was to be like, you and I are going to write office apps, you may say, uh, I don't think I'm qualified to do that. I don't know if you are or not. I'm just making stuff up at this point. Um, <laughs> and you may say, I'm not qualified to do that. And the reason you say that is because you've never done it before. Why would you be qualified to do that? It's like me trying to be qualified to ride a unicycle, right? Which I can't. So my advice to people who feels this, oh, I don't feel like I belong here, is break it down, right? Into steps, debug this process and say, all right, there are parts of this process that I feel qualified to do and there's parts I do not feel qualified to do. What are they? So from my own example, I absolutely do not feel qualified to lead an advocacy team for Power Platform, right? I said, I joined this team two weeks ago. I just learned about this product last year. How am I qualified to lead advocacy for this? So I had to break it down. And I said, what, do, what am I feeling and posturing about? Is it leading advocacy? No, I did it for Windows, I did it for HoloLens. I do know how to do that. Is it speaking in front of lots of people? Not really, I do that all the time. Is it writing content so others can learn? Not really, I do that all the time. Is it the product? Yes, it's the product. It's that I don't feel like I know the ins and outs of the product that well. So if you were to ask me, where exactly is the connector for you know, Azure SQL to Power Apps? I would just freeze, like, I do not know. I think it's in the Azure portal somewhere, somewhere. So I would feel that sense of impostering, like, oh, I don't know, so I don't belong here. It's no, I just don't know the product that well. That's okay, I know advocacy well. So what I need to do now is identify things I'm good at, advocacy, things I'm not good at, product. Learn the product, that's it. It just becomes a really easy to-do list or to-learn list, right? Learn it all mindset, not know it all mindset. I love it. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank this you was very a really much. terrific conversation. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Microsoft Ignite.